Somerset Maugham once told us that he has never pretended to be anything but a storyteller. It has amused him to tell stories, and he's told a great many. Now, those of us who helped to make these three into a film are happy once again to pay tribute to a great writer. Here he is to introduce Trio. Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, if you see me facing you once again in this unaccustomed role for me, you only have yourselves to blame. If you hadn't liked the four stories we showed you in quartet, we shouldn't have been encouraged to show you three more. Of course, we know it's a risk to try to repeat success, and we have to leave it to you to judge if we've been well advised or not. The Verger. On an afternoon in May 1924, there was to be a christening at St. Peter's Neville Square, a church much favored by the fashionable for these ceremonies. The verger, Albert Foreman, was ironing his second best gown for the occasion. During his 17 years of service, he'd had a succession of these gowns, but he'd never been able to throw them away. And so they lay wrapped in brown paper in a bottom drawer in his bedroom. You was going to clear out that drawer this morning, Mr. Foreman? So I was. Well, how much longer are you going to keep putting it off? I don't know. I just haven't got the art to get rid of them somehow. What you can possibly want with a lot of old gowns cluttering up the place for beats me. All right, I'll do it tomorrow. You better had if you don't want to see them turned into dusters. Back by six, won't you? Can't say. With old Ferguson, you always knew where you were. 35 minutes to the dot. But with this new chap, anything might happen. I'll have your tea for you at six anyway. Right, you are, Mrs. Brown. Thank you. What a job. Thank you. Thank you, Virgil. Very nice service. Thank you very much, sir. Five Bob. And him the tenth inheritor of a foolish face. I don't know what the aristocracy's coming to. <laughs> Took his time, didn't he? Yeah, he believes in doing it proper while he's about it. What are you waiting for? Oh, his neighbours wants to see me about them bells. Oh? Ferguson always left them to me. What's he want to bother himself with them for? Because he's the sort that likes to have his finger in every pie. Well, if you ask me, it'll take a bit of getting used to. Foreman, will you come into the vestry a minute? I have something to say to you. Very good, sir. Very nice christening, I thought, sir. Funny how the baby stopped crying the moment you took him. I've noticed they very often do. After all, I've had a good deal of practice with them. Good afternoon, my lord. Afternoon, Foreman. Good afternoon, sir. Didn't expect to find you here today. Didn't myself, as a matter of fact. But the vicar here wanted to talk, so here we are. We've got something rather unpleasant to say to you, Foreman. You've been here a great many years. I think His Lordship and the General agree with me that you've always fulfilled the duties of your office to the satisfaction of everybody concerned. Admirably, admirably. Mm. Thank you, sir. But a most extraordinary circumstance came to my knowledge the other day. I felt it my duty to impart it to the church wardens. I discovered, to my astonishment, that you can neither read nor write. The last vicar knew that, sir. He said it didn't make no difference. He always said there was a great deal too much education in the world for his taste. It's the most amazing thing I ever heard. Do you mean to say that you've been virgin of this church for 17 years and never learned to read and write? I went into service when I was 12, sir. The cook at my first place tried to teach me once, but uh, I didn't seem to have the knack for it. And then what with one thing and another, I never seemed to have the time. Don't, don't you ever want to write a letter? The lady I lodge with is quite a scholar, sir. And if I want to write a letter, she writes it for me. It's not as if I was a betting man. Uh, well, I've talked the matter over with these gentlemen, Foreman, and they agree with me that the situation is quite impossible. At a church like St. Peter's, Neville Square, we cannot have a verger who can neither read nor write. No, sir. Oh, please understand that I have no complaints against you. You always do your work. 
Quite satisfactorily, I have the highest opinion, both of your character and your capacity. But we haven't the right to take the risk of some accident which might happen, owing to your lamentable ignorance. I oh, see, sir. It's a matter of prudence, as well as a principle. I never took to him, not from the first. They made a great mistake ever giving him St. Peter's. Didn't the others say nothing? No, he jockeyed them into it. But I could see they didn't like it. And so I should hope. He nagged them into it. That's what he did. You're going to let yourself be put upon without making a fuss? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Brown. I have my pride. Even if I can't read all right. What are you going to do? Sleep on it. And decide tomorrow. Good afternoon, Foreman. Good afternoon, sir. I have some good news for you. I met Mrs. Fitzwilliam just now. She'll have the new altar cloth ready by Friday. About time too, sir. She's been promising it ever since Christmas. Well, now we shall have it ready for Easter. We must be thankful for small mercies. Yes, sir. Well, now, Foreman, have you thought over our little talk yesterday? Yes, sir. Well? I'm very sorry, sir. I'm afraid it's no good. Oh, come now, Foreman. That's not the right spirit. I'm too old a dog to learn new tricks, sir. I've lived a good many years without knowing how to read or write. And without wishing to praise myself, I, I think I may say I've done my duty in that state of life in which it has pleased a merciful providence to place me. And if I could learn now, I don't know as I'd want to. You've quite made up your mind? Quite, sir. In that case, Foreman, I'm afraid you'll have to go. Yes, sir, I quite understand. I should be happy to end in my resignation as soon as you've found someone to take my place. Albert had never troubled with such questions before. The virgins of St. Peter's, like the popes in Rome, were there for life. He'd saved a tidy sum, but not enough to live on without doing something. It occurred to him now that a cigarette would comfort him, but his packet was empty. He decided not to take his usual way home, but wandered into a street in search of a tobacconist. It was a long street, but he couldn't find a shop that sold cigarettes. There was no doubt about it, he'd have to go home without one. What's going on? Oh, Glad. Oh, it's Glad. She's engaged. Fancy that now. Who's your lucky fellow? Oh, I did, of course. So you caught him at last, have you? I never thought he'd got much of a chance. Well, I like that. He's been after me for months. That's right, and we're celebrating. See, have a glass of beer, Mr. Foreman. I don't think I will, thank you. Oh, come on. Well, I've just gone up to my room. I'll join you presently. Come Oh, I am sorry, Mr. Foreman. I knew the minute you came in. It's that vicar, isn't it? Give me the sack here. Yes. After 17 years. Whatever are you going to do now? I don't know exactly. I've got a sort of an idea on the way home. A funny thing happened. I wanted a packet of fags. And I had to walk over half a mile before I found a tobacconist. What's so funny about that? Well, I can't be the only chap as walks along them streets and wants a fag. I shouldn't wonder but what a fellow might do very well somewhere around there. Tobacco and sweets, you know. I've got a bit of money saved up. I've got half a mind to buy a little shop and see what happens. You do have ideas, I must say, Mr. Foreman. That's not the only one. I've got another. What's going to happen to you now Glad's getting married? Well, Ted will come and live here, of course. Glad's got her own room. It only means buying a double bed. Oh, that'll make trouble, that will. A young fellow 